back to the MWOD Google Hangout. I am very, very pleased to have, uh, for lack of a better word, like a spiritual sister on today. We were just saying that uh, I'm, I'm here with the lovely and amazing, big-brained, um, revolutionary, evolutionary Katie Bowman. Um, you may have known her from her handle. She's at Nutritious Movement. She has many books in the space about reclaiming your body, about how to think about moving barefoot, move like a human being, um, how to restore your sleeping patterns. And really has brought in, you know, one of the things that's been great about this, this emerging community is that so many of the people that I'm working around and, and touching, we end up talking towards the same middle, but from so many different, different directions. And the lovely Katie Bowman obviously is, is one of the big drivers of, of changing the way, way people are thinking about who they are as, as in this modern age and making sure that we stay in contact with the physiology that made us who we are today. And uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm really excited to, to open up your brain to all these people who've never seen it before. I know, and I'm so excited to finally get to connect with you and, and meet you, this is great. Uh, we've had on the MWOD before, Rafe Kelly, he lives up near you now, right? He's kind of in that world. Uh, obviously, you uh, know um, the lovely Jill Miller, who uh, also is a big Brainiac person. Um, we decided to kind of hang out finally, formally. We've been trying to for ages, but um, we get tagged a lot on Twitter about a few concepts. So let's, let's jump right in and take some of those things on. One of the first things that gets tagged that you are, are talking a lot about is how to sleep and this is such a big hot topic button for people and I'd love to kind of get into the nitty-gritty so what I have advocated for for a long time is that I see athletes who are very extension sensitive that they are sitting all the time short anterior hip don't have normal length missing hip extension right very very short stiff thoracic spine and what ends up happening is that when they jump on a very hard mattress or hard surface man they, they sleep overextended all night long or they adopt a whole bunch of crazy patterns where they're kicking one leg up underneath the other leg and they're trying to compensate for that position, right? And what we've advocated for is saying, hey, look, while that's happening, you should wake up in the morning feeling great. But while you're in this state, sleeping in something that is akin to a hammock or that unloads that gives your spine a chance to catch up for the day so we're not putting another spinal stressor load in. So when people take that advice who are extension sensitive, then what ends up happening is that we see that they have, you know, they can actually lay on the bed flat for the first time in their lives. They don't have to adopt some crazy pattern. But that's clearly not what we should be able to sleep anywhere, anytime, any place. And what ends up happening sometimes is the old advice that we used to give people around mattresses, whereas, you know, these were old herniated guys who needed to sleep in extension to deal with the herniations. But that's still not the right advice anyway. When people sometimes start to follow this this full, full capacity advice that you've been giving them, sometimes they're like, hey, my back is stiff in the morning. Can we talk about that? Because I think you and I are talking about the same thing, but people aren't prepared for either side. Well, I think it's, it has, I think it has to do with this bigger idea of transitioning. And also, it's kind of like shoes. Like everyone was wearing really stiff shoes. And then it was like, hey, maybe our feet are supposed to move. So then everyone ran out and started to go barefoot. And then you started to see people who are aching and stiff in between. And so where that bit of information about you should be able to sleep anywhere on any type of hard surface and you should start thinking about minimizing your sleeping space to work towards it over time. And then they, and then they're, I think they're confused. There's just too much information. Like, wait, am I supposed to go sleep on the floor on a lead pillow or am I supposed to you know, be comfortable? So I think it's just more about helping people understand biological principles, physiological principles. And, and it's a complex matter. You need to bolster yourself where you are. And sometimes that is in a particular style of mattress. However, what people are asking is, what is the mattress I'm supposed to sleep on for the rest of my life? And that's not really the answer. It's like, well, right now while you're hurting, this is probably pretty good. But while you're doing all of these other things, consider that while your mattress supports you right now, in the same way that while an orthotic in a shoe supports a knee or a hip injury temporarily, to use that orthotic indefinitely is to kind of glue yourself to those injuries indefinitely. So you want to just kind of understand that devices, bolsters, I call everything kind of an orthotic or a cast are used 
in temporary situations to support you as you transition away from needing them. So I think, I think probably what we get tagged on most often is the sleeping thing. It's like, wait, firm mattress, sleep on the ground. I don't know. I'm so confused. And it's like, well, there's not, we're not really saying different things. It's just all about the situation, right? It's a situation, the big picture. That's right. And as we've been advocating, you know, we've been talking about transition back to flat shoes. You should be able to, I'm like, you should be able to run barefoot. I'm a big guy, but I can still go run a mile barefoot hard. And, but I didn't get there overnight. And as you're saying, you know, people in that transition back, they, you know, there's a lot of work to get your body back into its normal physiologic state. You know, when you were a kid, you just willed out a sleeping bag at your friend's house on the carpet and we're like, that's good to go. It didn't matter. And then something, something started to change, you know, and it, it started, we're starting to see sort of aggregated dysfunction. And then all of a sudden this is, the, you know, this normal, you're like, well, I, I can't sleep on anything except the couch which is basically a sinkhole, right? Or a, or a hammock. So I just, I really wanted to clear that up and, and just you know, say that, hey, look, you know, our body should have immense capacity to sleep on any surface. You should be able to sleep on a soft surface, on the sand, on the ground, you know, all those things. <clears throat> I just ran into a, a soldier who had come back from some brutal uh, deployments in Afghanistan. He said, you know what got me right again? I started sleeping on the ground. You know, and he says, and I struggled and struggled and struggled and I slept on the ground. And he's like, I don't know if it was grounding and I was touching the ground, but sleeping on that hard surface, he fought for it, fought for it, and it literally forced his body to unwind. He was miserable for about a week and then he became less miserable. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And also, you know, it depends on like if you're an office, an office jockey, you know, and you're sitting all day and then you want to try sleeping a different way, you know, it might be more better facilitated if you start moving around throughout the day and then try to sleep on a hard surface. You have to look at kind of how you move throughout the day, throughout a month to figure out what's the best program for you to start transitioning. Yeah, fantastic. I think that's such reasonable advice. You have many books out. You have a recent book out. Has it already come out, the, the, the standing book? The standing book, yes, it's the official publication date for the standing book is uh, December. So we are in December now, and it's it is out. It got out a little. It came out a little quick, uh, faster than we thought, because the printing press was able to like move it a month, which never happens, right? In publishing, you never get your book a month early, but we did for the "Don't Just Sit There" book. So yeah, I've been doing that, and. Then I have a book on diastasis recti, which is an abdominal kind of separation book, which comes out in February. So I'm kind of in this weird space that almost never happens of having two books out, brand new books at the same time, just because of a fluke publication um, schedule error where it kind of dropped into our lap. So yeah, I have, I'm working hard for those two books right now. You're going to get sued by your own management. I mean, isn't that what happened to Prince? He put two competing albums out at the same time. So I might have to start referring to you as the Prince of the Body, you know, I, or the artist know. formerly known as Prince, you know. The, um, well, let's talk, let's talk about that for a second. So we got, we got, you have two big projects. I'm also working on a stand-up book, as you know, yes. which is out in February. And, uh, and once again, I really appreciate that we take such divergent approaches, and yet we're, we end up coming to the same thing, looking at, like you say, the principles of what makes us human. Let's talk about um, the diastasis recti book. Can you explain what that is to people? Because my wife had a herniated belly button from, from – uh, her second, first pregnancy had the mesh in. It was, a, you know, it's it's a horror. Explain what that is to people, and then show them and talk about how you're actually helping people get their lives back because this is a devastating stabilization injury on the spine for for women. Yeah, and it's interesting because I, I put in the front of the book a quote from an insurance company how that it's not a real it's not a real injury. It's a cosmetic only injury, um, or it's an issue. It's it's cosmetic, meaning that the fact that you're right half of your rectus abdominis has distanced itself from the left half. I mean, the book is about forces. The book is about pressure, pressure related injuries. So diastasis recti <clears throat> is, it's, they're, they're not quite sure exactly what it is, but it's some sort of distortion to the linea alba, which is the connective tissue for those, I know you know, but for those that don't know, the connective tissue that is like, if you were looking at like a six pack muscle, it'd be the the raphe or the single line that runs down the center. And it gets, it gets stretched, thinned, or it gets torn. Either of those situations would fall under the heading of diastasis recti. There is now kind of an understanding where maybe it might be actually 
some thinning in the linea semilunaris, which are the right and left reefy to the right and left of the linea alba. But either way, what you're looking at is if you were a container, that container has a, essentially a wall blown. The, mus the walls are muscular in, in most cases, in most places, but you do have these like thin connective tissue areas. Um, and when they get, I don't want to say destroyed, because that would, I think, imply that you can't put them back together again. But when they get distorted, then your pressure systems don't work very well, your stabilization mechanism, your force generation, none of that is able to really function optimally. So you start doing all these coping mechanisms and you start seeing other pressure related ailments. So it's, it's just that, it's a, it's a book on how, how, what are the things that can push that apart from the inside? Pregnancy is one of them, but it always gets kind of lumped as a pregnancy, a pregnancy issue, but there's men, that have diastasis recti. There are new liparous women, which are women who haven't had a baby yet who have diastasis recti. Diastasis recti is actually really common in extremely fit, really tense abdomen, like the tight, there's like a physiological point of having too much tension where when you put too much tension and then a baby inside of it, then you end up getting rips and tears. And so it's just kind of explaining, I think my books explain how things work. You know, like your books are great, but like they're so heavy in the treatment part of it, so heavy in all the things you can do where I think I probably spend more of my time fleshing out exactly, exactly the mechanism because I think that the treatment is easier to follow and stick to when you understand why. I would totally agree and I would say that if, and I know that you don't have time, but our whole life on MWOD is explaining why. The yeah. books though, you know, we get 500 pages in and we're like, oh, you know, at some point we have to, you know, say, okay, here's the, the manual, I, but I totally agree. And what's interesting, uh, you know, we have a woman at our gym who had carried a couple of babies and she's a former gymnast and was very comfortable with a lot of, you know, we see the sequela of problems that usually accompany this phenomenon and overextended pelvis is one of them. And, it, it, and I would say this change, this, this tear, the dissociation of those two, uh, that piece of fascia, the piece of connective tissue, that linea alba, is, I would say, a st uh, analogous to a lot of the sports hernias that we see, the inguinal areas that we're seeing so much tension and poor mechanics on the tissues that are designed to squeeze and stabilize. Suddenly, you put a big, large load in that thing, and it's, you, it's, you're, it's like, you know, duct tape is, is very strong this way, but as soon as you put a little torsion in that duct tape, we start to see, you know, the fibers start to become challenged. And I think it's vital that people understand that, A, hey, look, good positioning around the, the, the pelvis lumbar relationship and tissues that are supple and aren't tacked down and stiff. Because when I see abs of steel, I think this person has no stabilization strategy and they're overcompensating with that. You know, all the gymnasts I know, they all flat stomachs. They don't have bulging, oozing six packs, you know, and I think it's very interesting that we see when that becomes the dominant strategy, the loading plus the, the out of position loading really does cause mayhem in there. And we have this woman in our gym who, when she double unders, she has diastasis recti, and when she double unders in a great position, there's no problem. As soon as she overextends, pee comes out, you know, and, and I think this is really a downstream symptom of a lot of the problems that we're talking about. I, I am not, I'm sitting too much. I can't engage the, the endopelvic fascia through the, through the winding up of the pelvis, through the hip. And suddenly I create all these weird compensations. I can't stabilize, boom. And now this is really for me a downstream or, or analogous component to pelvic floor dysfunction or poor diaphragm function. I mean, you're, you're so on the, on the, Beat. I hope people see this book and read it because it will make you a better squatter. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, this book, we put diastasis, we put diastasis recti on the cover because there are no books on diastasis recti out right now. There is no book that's got like diastasis recti. And it's like it's a huge, it, it's a huge problem. And, but I put in there, I'm like, you know, it's a it's not a problem. I mean, it's a problem for you who has it because it's messing with your life, but it's a symptom. It's a symptom of all of these other things. And you know, everyone's out there, you know, most women who have a baby or two, like are dealing with this lack of core strength. And maybe their motivation initially is core appearance, but they are, you know, they're, they want like the five exercises or, or whatever to fix it. And I'm like, you know, the first thing you can do for your diastasis recti is stop leaning, stop letting your linea alba hold you up all day long. I mean, 
you're trying to do the corrective exercises to fix the muscle, but all day long, you know, you got your high heels on and you, you know, you're tipping your pelvis a particular way and you're standing, even if you're standing at your work desk, your belly's resting on the front of the thing. And, and all day long, you are undoing anything that you do with that 40 minutes that you set aside for those corrective exercises. So like back your hips up, drop your heel height on your shoe and drop your ribs. It's like you're, you're already halfway there and you didn't have to do a single exercise. But yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's not for women who split their abdominals. It's for anyone who wants, wants to understand the relationship between organ prolapse, pelvic floor downward pressure, which is also uh, inguinal hernia. It could be a guy, you know, inguinal hernia has got that. Um, a diaphragm that just doesn't budge because you're sucking your stomach in all of the time or you thrust your ribs and your geometry of your muscle fibers don't allow them to generate force. I mean, geometry is huge when it comes to force production of the muscles. And that means, or that translates into the shapes that you assume with your body throughout the day are affecting the potential of your force production, which is going to translate into strength and stability. And then also the things that I'm interested in, blood flow, immunity, cellular performance, the ability for cells to, to turn over into the perfect replication of what it was before, not go wonky and become some other side of disease. Well, and even dysfunction, you know, if we even just keep it out that just that the, your body is not doing what it's supposed to do, how it was designed to do it. We, I tell people all the time that, hey, look, if you move well, you're going to see a lot less stiffness and tension in your body. And the more inefficiently you move at speed or at load, the more compensation. You wonder why you have stiff, stiff calves all the time. Well, it turns out you walk like a stand like a duck and jump like a duck and those poor muscle fibers are working obliquely and they have to create stiffness to try to compensate for that inefficiency, uh, that geometry of the musculature. I love that concept. That's, that's so important. Well, I figure, you know, most people haven't taken physics or the high, higher levels of anatomy and muscle function, but almost everyone took geometry. And, and so I try to frame everything in terms of geometry because I think that there's a, we all have an inherent sense of torques and geometry, even if we didn't have any formal education so I, in those topics. So I just try to present it that way. And people are like, oh, it finally makes sense. I didn't really know why I was keeping my ribs down. I didn't know why like thrusting my ribs all day long was turning off my abdominal muscles, essentially. You know what I mean? And then I bring them down and, and anyway. So yeah, I, I like I like it. I'm a geometry key. You know this. You know I love I love that you're taking this on because you know so much of the underlying message that you're telling people is hey look, I don't think you have a formal schema to understand how you move. Yeah. You weren't you weren't in yoga as a young kid. This is what really what yoga was trying to do. You, you know Joseph Pilates was very serious about the way he thought about how the body should function and how we should formally train it. We see it in dancers. Sometimes we see it in formal martial arts. We see some of it in gymnastics when we don't get obsessed with, you know, can we perform the trick, yes or no? But <clears throat> so many of us come to the game so late and have very under, low understanding of, of how the impacts of how we're moving or the positions that we adopt, how that, that you know, implicates, you know, the function of the body, especially in lieu of the fact that, you know, we shouldn't be waiting around till we have a disastrous separation in the musculature uh, until we have a herniation. I mean, what we have been hammering on people is saying, hey, look, we have to move beyond the set of lagging indicators, pain, right. swelling. It's, it's too much because the engineering of the body is so good that we can buffer these positions forever. I mean, how many times do you have to walk till your big toe starts to flex over to the side and you create a bunny? And literally, it's millions and millions and millions of oscillations before you've destroyed that joint. And then all of a sudden, you're like, oh, my toe hurts for the first time, but it's always been like this. Right. You know, so you know, I, I think it, you, I really appreciate the approach. It's so accessible. And it really, we want people to understand that the movement practice right, is, which is part of the physical practice, extends throughout the course of the day. It starts from the decisions you're making about the shoes that you wear, how much water you're drinking, are you getting sunlight, and that, and that once you start to reconcile all those aspects, suddenly you're seeing it's the same thing. I've been trying to get athletes to say, I'm always saying, like, are you ready to train today? Because this hour is formal movement training, and we're going to actually get something done because you're going to go to the Olympics next week, right, or you're playing in the NFL, or you're going to play kickball, right? It doesn't matter, but you have to be thinking, I can't just get it done in this magical hour. I think we have sold people a bill of goods that that hour is going to somehow disrupt the, the, the practice over and over and over again. But people just don't have a basis. 
Yeah, I think um, this, this has been a really good year for collaboration in general between mod modalities or people, which has been really great. But I think also the, in the academic research of it really coming out of going, you know what, there was the refining of sedentary to actively sedentary. That was huge, you know, because I think that people were going, I'm active, you're sedentary. But then if we just do an objective movement analysis, like, well, yeah, you guys are different by 4%. So you're both sedentary. That was, that's huge, right? Because you have a whole group of people who <coughs> have really made a priority to not be sedentary, but then it turns out on paper they still are. And then we have things that are coming out about um, movement throughout the day beyond exercise. And I think a lot of the sitting research was really integral in kind of teasing out the difference between being a, that it wasn't the chair, you know, the chair or the sitting, it was really ca calling out the stillness. Like you can't consume copious amounts of stillness and offset it, you know, like in the same way that you can't eat candy bars all day and then offset, you cannot offset physiology. You do not offset Snickers bars by eating a salad. It doesn't work that way. That's not true. Hey, hey, hey no. back off lady. You're freaking me out here. You know, um, one of our friends who's an exercise physiologist named Alan Lim, who is an exercise physiologist to some of the best cyclists on the planet, really has this MO. They say, hey, you can't cheat your physiology. And, we, and he might be talking about performance-enhancing drugs or sleep or mm -hmm. stress quality. But you're, you know, it all comes back that these are governing systems that work throughout all aspects. And why shouldn't it also be about nutrition and sleep and movement quality? You know, one of the – if you ask Juliet, my wife, and what her chief recommendation is, she's like, look, I don't even care if you exercise sometimes. Just show me that you're walking around. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we walk our kids to school every day. And for us, that's an additional 5K every day of walking. And the difference of being a 40-year-old athlete, 42-year-old athlete, and, and getting this extra 5K in is amazing. I mean, really, like my body does what it's supposed to do. And if I'm conscious about my other practices – I do, I have a breathing practice. I follow, started following Wim Hof a few months ago, like six months ago, and that changed my life, actually having a breathing practice every day. You know, um, re, you know, alkalizing my body through manipulation of my pH through breathing. Plus, the other, some of the other things is that I do cold water immersion in the morning. So I'm my, you know, I, I get in my hot tub in the morning and then I sit in this ice bucket up to my neck until I'm, you know, until I'm frigid. It's as far away from the train stimulus as I can so that I'm not trying to slow that down, but about reclaiming my nervous system, about reperfusing my tissues. It's pretty amazing how what I thought was, hey, I'm pretty integrated and I'm pretty organized and still had such blind spots. And that, I think that's what we want to tell people is that, hey, look, this is a – you're never going to arrive at the perfect practice because you're a mom, because you work, because you have to sit in the car and you get – you have to eat airplane food once in a while, right? But it should be process. I'm always trying to move – my environment and my behavior towards reclaiming some theoretical idea. And that, and that makes it really tenable. Well, it's awareness, right? I think, I think it's really important to say that, hey, you and me, we radically remove blind spots all of the time because we are in this culture too. We came from a particular training that had a particular mindset. And so I'm constantly going, I never thought of that. Of course, of course, you know, and then, I go back to my body of knowledge and some things have to go and some things just have to be reorganized and that's okay. Like the, the whole idea of, of something being wrong and making like everything in it invalid is so not the way information works and removing blind spots is kind of like I call it which for me, the way I work with movements are like the equivalent to nutrients. I talk about movement in terms of nutrients, but I feel like, awareness is its own nutrient because you can't fix a problem if you don't know what the problem is and there's a a lot of people suffer with you know aches and pains or more significant diseases and i think that coupled with those diseases even more stressful is the lack of understanding of why it's happening to you why I, I did everything. I did everything I was supposed to is something that i hear all of the time and then they pull out the list of what they're supposed to and it's like the government approved, move 20 minutes a day, you know, stretch these, your 12 muscle groups, because you have 12, stretch these 12 muscle groups and like, okay, well this, what you're supposed to do every day has been refined, you know, and 
this might not be the full package. And then when people get a sense of what their body needs, they have a choice to do it or not, but then they're not swirling around in confusion. They quite under, they understand like, you know what? I know I slacked off on this other thing that Kelly told me if I did, I wouldn't have this. So now I have a protocol when this arises to go to, as opposed to this is arising. And I think I just need to go get medical treatment because I have no idea why I have this disease as opposed to just seeing it as a side effect of your choices of behavior. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's such a powerful statement and really talks about shifting the low side of control back to the person. I don't think people realize that, you know, how disruptive people like you really are in the system, you know, saying, Hey, look, you should have a basic schema for how you work and you should be able to talk about that with your kids and you should make decisions. Hey, you know, my wife every once in a while, she's like, you know, I'm going to wear high heel shoes because they're, I look cute when I, with this dress and these flat hippie shoes don't look cute with this dress. But the rest of the time, she's barefoot in the house and realizing that that compromise comes at a cost. And I think even just that awareness around that. You know, we have a friend who has such pelvic floor dysfunction, like immense pelvic floor dysfunction. She's a beautiful, successful woman. She has to wear an adult diaper all the time, right? And she's not even sure when. I mean, clearly we have blood flow issues. We have mechanical issues. But she refuses to give up her three-inch heels, which she lives in day after day after day and when I said hey you know this is part of this contributing feature she said no way I can't give it up you know and I was like well I guess you like the diaper you know I mean and I think what's really amazing is that really once the choice has been become ours then we really are empowered to say hey I I can live with that or not live with that as part of my life and Mm -hmm. and I remove the the quick fix out of the system because we have to get rid of that this this we're, we're playing the long game and we have to have much more sophisticated conversations about integrating the aspects of our life. And we're, I, I really do feel hopeful because I think we're seeing, we're seeing that, you know, you and I are a good example of what I call mutually accommodating systems, right? This is Buckminster Fuller's concept. And that I don't, I, there's nothing that you say that I'm like, uh, I don't believe that. Because I'm telling you that all my friends or all the people who are thinking it's a linear you know, connection between going to the Olympics or fighting or doing it. And then, you know, Hey, I, I have, I'm just a pregnant woman, you know, and I don't mean, I'm not, you know, belittling the small, but the idea, the idea is that the function is the same. How do we scale it up or scale it down? My girls to your most elite athlete is the same contiguous conversation. And I'm really grateful that we're having these levels because we're not going to, I clearly do not speak to everyone and you also don't speak to everyone. And it's important that people can see the overlap and also that we're saying, Hey, look, this is in your lap and it's so easy. You don't have to throw away your life. You just have to make these small conceptual changes about how you're interacting with your environment. Yeah. I mean, some of the changes are ridiculously small. And even, even if there's ones that you don't want to make, just make the ones that you do and, mm-hmm. and you're better. And then what happens is, you know, you get that switch from extrinsic motivation of like Kelly said, Katie said, or yeah, I'll try it because I want outcome X to the intrinsic motivation where you then truly, you know, like your friend who doesn't want to give up her heels. I think there's so many scenarios of that. People don't want to give up cigarettes. They don't want to give up. They don't want to give up the sport that every time they do it or the game that they play once a week that puts them into bed. Like you don't want to give up your joy because you define that. But a lot of times that's because you haven't experienced other forms of joy. You haven't truly experienced something in your body of being at whatever degree of wellness where you didn't start to crave that level of wellness. Again, you're like, you are willing to let things go. So sometimes you do take little leaps of faith going, I don't want to do that, but my wife is making me or these group of people that I'm in wants to try it. And then you try it and then you do find yourself going more and more to the things that you were, no, were deal breakers for you. Like I have let some deal breakers go in my life that I would have swore I would have never let go, but you just have to usually push through it to the other side. <clears throat> you know, it turns out that wasn't a deal breaker. It turns out I didn't have an experience to compare it to. You know, um, one of our friends, a uh, very good athlete, um, very good tinkerer, conceptual, holistic, but like the legitest person on the planet, stopped drinking. And I have a bunch of other friends who've also stopped drinking or really curtailed their drinking. And, and when I say curtail, if someone pours them an amazing glass of wine, they'll have a little bit. They're not rude during dinner. They enjoy it as food. But, but you know, we, Juliet and I were like, well, you know, we should, we should, we should, we should let's play with that. 
And yeah. we literally have the amount of drinking that we do, a glass of wine, a, a drink when we go out to dinner, has almost dropped to zero. And I can tell you unequivocally, personally, and I'm not saying that's for everyone, but it has changed our lives. Like really, it's amazing how much better I feel. And I come from a, a, a five generation alcoholic family, so I probably shouldn't drink ever anyway. And I, w I didn't drink anything until I was almost 22 years old. But, you know, I used to belong to like a champagne club, you know, I got a, my favorite winemaker up in Napa is close and really I drink less and less and less and less and I had one glass of wine for Thanksgiving and was hammered and felt terrible, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's amazing. Exactly your point is that when we, you know, the system is so robust around all of us that, you know, I don't think people realize that to your, to your point that Sometimes you don't have to have a complete hygiene around a behavior, but improving some part of the system reinforces the whole system. And that's and the model is again just looking at the abdominal tear or this tear in this this linea alba is that you know it's not just this, it's not just your rectus, it's you know it's the fascia, it's the system, it's your the diaphragm. You know when we talk about um, collapsed feet, collapsed, destroyed arches. You know, I'm like, hey, look, you've stretched out all the ligaments around those bones. That's why your navicular bone is on the ground, right, in the collapsed arch. But fortunately, you have fascia and you have muscle and you have the joint capsule and you have all these redundant systems in the body that can pick up the slack for an, a damaged system. And I think that's the problem is that when we, we blow through all of our get out of jail free cards, we're not left with any options, but the body, body systems are so robust and so re uh, redundant in so many ways that when you improve one aspect of it, the whole system improves. It's so interesting. <laughs> I like the, your use of redundant. The ligament system is basically the redundant system. It's just that you're not using anything else. Like we don't, we come, you know, you're a highly, not you, but we as a culture, we're a highly sedentary culture who has moved almost, even if you did sports, like, comparatively speaking to humans on the planet that have to move through nature for survival purposes. The discrepancy between not just the magnet, not just the quantity, but the qualities and the types and, that, and the robustness of that cross training system, if you will, and the ad adaptations that come from it compared to our movement. Most people's muscles really don't even participate very much when they go to move. Like they're moving across the ground, but not very much of them is moving to accomplish that. And so people all the time like, oh, this ligament is shot or whatever. I'm like, the ligaments are the seatbelts of your car. You have brakes of your car. You have never once applied the brakes of your car. You just ram your car into a wall and let the seatbelt stop you every time. So who cares if your seatbelt's broken? You don't need a seatbelt in a well-driven car. And that's, I think that that's a perspective that people don't, they're like, but I have this ligament. It wasn't it necessary. It was like, yeah, that was your backup. The good news is you never even touched your primary system. So let's do that. And then lo and behold, pain-free movement, even amidst a destroyed tissue, because that was just kind of redundant or, or tertiary, really, almost, if you will. <clears throat> yeah, I love it. I, I think that's fantastic. You know, um, you know I, I, I think it, it's incredible you know, once you're into function, you know, the examples of people tear their meniscus and um, I'm like, look, you don't have a whole bunch of extra meniscus. You don't, I mean, you, you know, your, your body, you, you know, the designer, the creator wasn't like, you know what, let's give Katie an, an extra 20% because she might use it. So you, you need all of this system, but it turns out <clears throat> that if you're efficient and you remove the shear on your knee and you're not just always creating shear through the joint that the, the, the system is so amazing that you can get by with less, even though I'd like you to have more. And I think, I think that idea is, can be extrapolated to almost any of these systems. Sorry, the, my little hound dog, he knows when uh, we're, we're on, we're having conversations. So he's, he's getting like small children. <laughs> exactly right. Uh, fantastic. Um, you're a crazy person. You have a couple books going out. What are you working on? What What is your personal pet peeve project? Like, what are you trying to solve right now that like is in the back burner? That I mean, obviously, if you, if you know if it's proprietary and you can't talk about it yet because you haven't. But I know you are noodling on something that that you're working on. What is it you're noodling on? Well, what I'm working on right now is. You know, we rebranded everything as nutritious movement because nutritious movement is actually it's an actually academic idea that I'm working on because 
I, I believe that mechanical nutrients inputs um, function the same way as dietary nutrients on a cellular level. So every time your body changes anything based on a load or some sort of movement, that's, that process is called mechanotransduction. And what happens is you move or stretch, and, and I don't always mean like your musculoskeletal system. You go out into a temperature, and that temperature is going to cause movements that are of smooth muscle, smaller muscle, movements of the skin, calluses. So all of the potential movements, when, when you are loaded in some way, your cells, the cells are what's responding. Your body, you, like you are a body fashioned out of a trillion smaller bodies. So anything that is happening to you that you see as, you know, a particular muscle or a particular region in your body is really just the cells in that area. So what I'm most, what I'm most interested in fleshing out is really this idea of the process of a mechanical input deforming a cell and then that cell adjusting its biochemical behavior based on that mechanical load, which is exactly the same way as you put some food in your mouth and it gets into your body and that food affects cellular behavior. Like that, we talk about diet on a more gross level, but on a, on a, on a smaller level, it's just affecting your biochemistry and movement is the same. And all these things that we have to our, our physiology is just adapting to everything. And it's usually adapting well, it's just the input sucks. And so I'm trying to figure out like, what would be, what would be, if we had to look at, if we broke movement into macronutrients, what would the macronutrients be, right? Because you've got fat, protein, and carbohydrates, and those are like clear, gross clumpings of a nutrient, but within those macronutrients, you know, like you can have a fat, but it can have other vitamins can come with a food. And so then there's macronutrients and micronutrients of movement, and I've been working on fleshing them out for a larger book just on nutritious movement. That's fantastic. I really appreciate you saying that. You know, we look at, you know, you can almost say hey, cardiorespiratory capacity, strength, yeah. right, right, um, as, as some of those pieces. And one of the conversations that we're having, and this is, this is what's so miraculous about the internet phase, is that I have so many friends who have come to the same conversations. One of the conversations we're constantly engaging in right now is, what is, how do I create children that are, movement fluent so that then they can then specialize or go play. What are the components to the de human development besides squat in the woods and take a poo, climb trees, because that doesn't always work for the kids in the city, right? So I, I so how do I put in the formal dietary, you know, uh, prescriptions, even though I should be able to forage and eat more vegetables? I mean, I love the notion and I really appreciate that you don't always sort of revert back to evolutionary, you know, psychology, evolutionary biological behavior. You know, it's like paleo is the way. I, you know, it helps us understand why we, you know, the evolutionary psychology, evolutionary bio, biology of who we are. But we're more sophisticated than that, and we have we we live in worlds that are, you know, my my house isn't always cold, and I'm not always struggling to squat on the ground to make a fire, and so. You know, to that point, I think that is really the right conversation to be having about what are the what are the what are the minimum effective doses? You know, in the you know how, how do if I don't if I live in this area and I don't get enough vitamin D, I better supplement with vitamin D. If I'm, you know, if I don't have any aerobic work, what is it the nature of those aerobic pieces that and and the breakdowns? I love it, and that's what we've really tried to do with Supplement 2.0 is really tell people, hey, look, there are fundamental shapes that your body has to be in. In order to in order to be able to express the rest of the pieces, and and if you're not even there, how how can you possibly expect to swim or do something or write an aria when you don't even have the the language of the vocabulary? I think that's oh, I'm so glad to hear you say you're working on that. That's that's good. I can't wait to read that. That's gonna be fantastic. Yeah, I'm excited. It's a it's huge though because it's you know you're it's not really an analogy because it's. It's pretty literal what I'm talking about, but at the same time, there aren't, I can't chemically reduce a compound of movement. You know what I mean? Like the, you can find vitamin D in food by burning it. And you know, you can, you can find something that you can test and measure, but you can't do that with movement. So it's a little bit more challenging, but it, what's 
heartening is that, you know, they are starting to go, hey, this cell has cancer or this clump of cells has cancer and we can squeeze it in a particular way and it stops being cancer. So that speaks very highly to that there is, that there is a good, that there is a right dosage of movement for the body, you know, or just like in the same, there's a profile of movement, not just a dosage, but like if you look at nutrients, a, a profile you know, you have you can get your macronutrients in order, but then you also have to get your micronutrients in order. And now it, maybe you have to get your food quality in order and your food freshness in order. Like there's so many other levels that are affecting the inputs that we don't know about with movement. So I, I use a lot of NASA stuff because NASA, ju just like we didn't really understand anything about dietary nutrients until you had clumps of people who are living kind of a radically different environment, people in jail, people on a ship you know, who, who were a kind of a natural experiment of sorts, right? You know, if you take a bunch of people on a ship, hey, you've limited their diet, they don't have this, they tend to get the same diseases over and over again. So for me, who's looking at the mechanical nutrients, people in space are in a hypogravity situation and they have very specific ailments that are similar to what we have on Earth, but they're exaggerated. So their bone loss is exaggerated, it's much, much um, faster up there. You know, you can have kind of like two weeks, you can have a bone loss in space that's equivalent to a multiple years of, of moving in a particular way or bed rest. You know, that's why they use bed rest for NASA research because you can put someone in bed and it's essentially hypogravity. Also things like infectious disease in space and you know, <coughs> resistance to antibiotics of astronauts up in space because we forget that our immune system is based on movement, that that the lymphatic system doesn't really move itself. It's moving based on the local movements of the rest of your body. So you got a shoulder that doesn't move, you have a hip that doesn't have a full range of motion. Your immune system is not fully functional in those areas. So it's not always, what's interesting to me is health and biological function. You know, these bigger pictures of like, man, movement, movement matters in the same way food matters. You are how you move, you are how you eat. And it's really direct, it's not really, Multiple. Yeah, and I, I and I really appreciate the way you're saying this because what what I see people do is they end up struggling to to reconcile a concept into their daily lives because it becomes so micro for people, so granular. You know that if I eat this turmeric, then this solves this, and pretty soon it's so redactive and reductionist that they can't you know see the whole. And when understanding the whole and how and its constituent parts is vital to the process but that the process takes care of itself because the system is designed based on these principles. You know, when you lay down at night, your discs swell up and suck in a whole bunch of nutrients. Good thing that you actually lay down at night, you know what I mean, or, or adopt these postures that, were, that allows the disc to rehydrate and, and recapture and, and replenish. And you don't have to even know that. You just have to make sure that you actually get enough sleep where that process can happen. You know, or, or you know, look, look at any of any of those ideas. I think that that's crucial and and really a useful way of, of understanding the high the high principles, but the granularness. And I think that really brings up to something that I appreciate about you very much, is that you also are a movement teacher, and and that you you know you're driven from not the academia side, but that's an important aspect of what you're doing. But I'm engaged right now with the conversations with a bunch of friends like Greg Cook about what we call practice-based evidence. That this is, we have to reconcile our experience as human beings with what we're coming to understand as the very complex processes underneath that. And that just because we don't understand or we get a new insight doesn't mean we have to discard the actual practical application, but those two things should coincide. Well, you know, scientists don't, scientists don't really do that either. When we get a new piece of data, you know, a, a, a piece of evidence, the, per, like, so, the scientific method is to gather a piece of evidence and take that piece of evidence in the context of all other evidence that exists. But when there was a shift kind of to an evidence-based practice, I feel like people could only behave based on what the, this single paper said. And it's like, well, but the scientists, like if you read the whole thing, like they're saying that this is, applies to this particular population, and these were the assumptions, and this was the model, and the assumptions in the model, neither of which are real life. Like, this is not a scenario that can actually happen. But 
we are at a time where I think the move to evidence-based kind of removed some critical thinking, like, right, because you didn't want to have to, like, if, if you thought through it critically, you risk that you run the risk of coming to an erroneous conclusion. So therefore better not just, just wait until someone hands you the paper on how to behave. And so reductionism in science is necessary for the purpose of investigation, but science is not a blueprint for how to live your daily life. You know, like when you reduce turmeric for what its properties are or vitamin X, Y, and Z for whatever you need. And then you're trying to like go, okay, I saw the paper on like this offset my cancer. And like, you're trying to like look at these 40 research articles or worse yet the headlines that were written about the articles that you read on Facebook and you're trying to like decide how to behave. What's not there is that the whole reason they started to look at these pieces was like that this population who just, you know, ate this fruit and this vegetable and they did really well and so then they're trying to break down to figure out what it was no one ever said that you're supposed to consume these compounds they're like people who live in this particular way had this outcome wonder, i wonder why and we don't really see the bigger picture because you're not engaged maybe in that full body of science and and one science whether it's kinesiology or therapy or nutrition they all go together so if you're only reading if you're only reading sleep studies you might not see that the sleep studies also depend on the nutritional studies and also depend on the movement studies and also depend on how much you engage in your community and and the quality of your air and that it's all of it and no one single nutrient is going to replace your need for overall 360 degree ball that is like the planet but also you and your system is not just underneath your skin it's it's you and interacting with the world like it's bigger it's bigger than the reductionism that's necessary to investigate it you mean eating less ice cream and just deadlifting more doesn't solve all the problems i think actually if you eat a lot of snickers you just eat a kale salad and it all goes away <laughs> i love it i love it okay look we've been eating up so much of your time please tell us where we can find your brain i know you're on twitter tell us where you are how do we find out more because uh Everyone should uh, should have you in their back pocket all the time. I think it's great. Just you know, you should pop up in the voice and be like, "What would what would Katie say? What would Katie do?" Oh, what would Katie say? Um, nutritious movement. Nutritious movement is essentially like I'm on Facebook and nutritious movements. Twitter is nutritious movement. Only movement doesn't have any vowels, so you can figure that out. Um, and nutritiousmovement.com is the new website going up any day now. That, oh, that's so exciting and so no work at all. It's amazing. And you don't, yes, you're, not, you're not even like a, a mother, are you? I mean, do you have a – I mean, you're crazy. How do you do – I don't know how, I know how you do that. I got a three and a four-year-old, and they're great. That's fantastic. And I love that you – what's really important, and I, I wanted to highlight that for a moment, is that you, unlike some of the young practitioners I know who aren't married, who don't have kids, who aren't running a business – like you run everything through that filter of, is this a realistic expectation for people with lives? Yeah. And I wanted to point that out because it's something that I think is so remarkable about you is that you actually make breakfasts and put kids down for naps and, and you have to do all of that and still work your own practice and run a business. And I really appreciate that uh, the advice you give and the way you speak on our behalf is run through that filter because it's very impressive. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I appreciate just your general positivity as a person. It's refreshing and it's inspiring. And um, I, it's, it's rare. It's rare. Not in the people that you list, like Jill Miller, she has it. And Rafe has like, there's people who have this positivity. And, and luckily, you're such a big personality that it goes so far. But I really appreciate just connecting with you and getting to bask in your positiveness. Thank you so much. Oh, um, it's my pleasure. We always try to point positive. We're always saying that, hey, look, you know, we don't we don't need to point out what we think are the incompleteness in other people's systems. We just point out that uh, we show we try to show our thinking and show what problems people are trying to solve. And when you, when, uh, I've said this before, but whenever you hear a coach or a lecturer or someone talk. Think about what problems they're trying to solve, not how they're necessarily trying to solve them. And then, then that really leaves their critical thinking open to understanding. And I think that is a way where we can, get, we can really advance the ball. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll finish with this idea. 
we have so many wonderful people working on it and connecting. It's not that people haven't been smart and tried to solve these problems before, because I think there have been. We've, we've been really clever humans for as long as there have been humans. But we have a chance to connect the dots in a real way in this generation of people in the next, you know, next 20, 30, 40 years. We, if we don't get a lot corrected, shame on us. Yeah, exactly. Well, hey, thank you so much for your time today. You are the best. I can't wait to hang out with you and, uh, and uh, pick your brain. And I can't wait to see what other projects you're working on. Thank you so much, dude. Thanks, Kelly. The lovely Katie Bowman. Thanks, dude. Talk to you soon.